Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. And uh, I wanted to do something a little different lately. Uh, obviously you guys have been watching for years, but I kind of wanted to take you a little bit deeper in my firearms journey. So like many people, I started off in the airsoft world, made that transition into the military. Then after getting out, really started delve, uh, basically diving into like uh, the civilian firearms uh, arena, if you will. Uh, and then ever since then, been kind of been able to do a little bit of everything from, you know, Milsim events, uh, different force on force with simunition, UTM, live fire. Um, so I've kind of kind of got to experience the gamut, but a lot of my experience definitely came from the airsoft side. So I thought it'd be interesting to kind of take you guys along with me on uh, my experience going through a couple of recent firearms competitions. So. I recently went to the IDARM, the Independence Day uh, Action Rifle Match, which is, um, you know, when I went last year, I did, wasn't sure what to expect. It's a definitely a very challenging rifle match, and it's a little bit different than what you normally think competition shooting is, because a lot of the stages are a little bit closer, and of course, there's a wide variety of different competitive shooting arenas from focused on like long guns uh, to handguns, a little mix in, in between, and you know, night matches and subgun matches and the list goes on. But this was a very accuracy focused rifle match. I would say this is probably the kind of rifle match, in my opinion, that uh, translates very well, especially if you're shooting at distance. This is very much aim small, miss small. Yes, speed is a factor. And of course, whoever has the fastest time does very well, but you gotta make sure you make your hits too, and you can't progress without making your hits on a lot of the targets, because it's majority a steel target competition. So, it I mean, some of these targets are like, there's like, I think there was only one real C-zone target in the entire thing, and it was moving at like four miles an hour at like 200 yards or something like that. And as you bound it up, it progressively got shorter. So I'll get to that in a bit. Uh, but then some of them are like 10 inch steel plates and some of them are like three inch poppers. So um, your zero had to be pretty good. And I actually took this gun right here. Um, this is a BCM Jack carbine um, that I got uh, maybe last year, maybe the year before. Basically, I've been wanting this gun for like 10 years, and I'll do a complete video on this gun, but essentially it's a 14.5. I zeroed it um, with, basically zeroed at 5200, which is basically that your deviation that essentially is your point of impact at 50. If you zeroed at 50, it'd be relatively close, relatively similar to the point of impact at 200. Now, there's still a little bit of work I've got to do because, you know, that's considering using like a standard optic. But ever since risers kind of got into it, the data is kind of, we're still figuring it out. Let's let's just say that. The people are still kind of figuring out the data portion, especially when you include risers and the zeros and different ammunition types and barrels and whatnot. But this is the gun that I used. I made sure several sessions to make sure that this thing was as zeroed as possible. And luckily for me, the range that I go to to do my zeroing has paper targets out to 100, which you set up for zeroing. And then it has steel at 200. And then it has steel, uh, like a larger size, like I guess you would call like a C-zone size steel at 300. And then smaller, um, steel targets at 300 as well, 300 yards or whatever. So um, it was actually a pretty good idea or way to kind of gauge out my zero. And of course, the fact is, if your gun is truly zeroed, you really want to be able to stretch the gun further out because these 14.5 carbines, you, you can shoot to like 500 pretty easy if you know what you're doing. And of course, if your eyesight or your optic enables you to see and PID what you're shooting at, um, which for me, Having the magnifier was huge because that definitely made my life a lot easier, especially when engaging targets much further at like the 200, you know, 150, 200 and beyond. Um, and I, the setup, it's kind of a weird setup that I've got here because um, the stuff up here doesn't really matter, especially for this match. But I was running the EOTech um, XPS on an absolute riser, and then I've got an aimpoint magnifier. So kind of a goofy combination between aimpoint and EOTech. Uh, but one thing about holographic sights, especially the EOTech, is it has a one MOA dot. So I actually ran an aimpoint uh, T1 last year, and I noticed a huge, huge difference, both during my zeroing sessions 
and at the competition when switching over to the EOTech. One, from a night vision perspective, it's just really nice to be able to night vision, but for two, for shooting at distance, that, that one MOA, MOA dot is so precise. Um, it really allows me to, to really kind of fine tune my zero, at least in my opinion, a little easier, where I was much more confident making hits out of distance with the EOTech than I was with the Aimpoint, which to me was very surprising because I've been an Aimpoint guy for a really long time. So the magnifier was a big game changer for me. It may not look like it because I don't wear glasses, but my eyesight is like not great at all. Um, so this is the setup that I used. And I think it made a huge difference in my performance because I took much, much more time zeroing it this year. Um, but then I also, because the second year I went, which was this year, um, which is the footage you're about to see, I focused much more on accuracy than I did on speed. I was like, you know, I would rather make the hit and if, it would, if I took a little more time, then be wasting rounds. And so I really focused on my efficiency in that regard, um, which is funny because I did have one um, procedural or penalty or whatever. And that, that penalty cost me from being number 15 out of 90 shooters to like 32. But knowing that one thing will we'll, we'll just, just change kind of where I was in the match, but I, it allowed me to see where I would have been if I did not make that mistake. So always learn. Uh, but without further ado, I kind of walk want to walk you through some of the stages that uh, I shot and um, yeah, just kind of go stage by stage and show you some, what I thought about my performance, what I could do better and uh, kind of what I was thinking about during that session. So without further ado, let's jump into it. All right. So to kind of set the stage, stage six was probably one of the most challenging stages last year. And this year was still challenging, but I actually thought it was kind of easier um, was because last year they had it on a swinging platform. But essentially, you have to get into position, shoot at a 10 inch steel plate that is about 240 yards away or whatnot, two hits for 5.56 rifles. Then you have to transition and shoot a moving C zone that moving four miles per hour left and right. It's on a track and there's actually a very narrow window. I kind of wish I could record the POV next time. Um, but you had to shoot it on the move. Um, and I'd never actually shot a steel target on the move before, which is really funny. And then um, once you get those two hits, you move on to the next uh, position, which is a tank trap. And same thing, you had to shoot at the 10 inch of steel at the top of the hill twice, get two hits, then shoot the mover. And then you move on to the ladder and you get two hits on there and two hits on there. And that's, it was a pretty straightforward stage, but a little bit challenging specifically because I'd never shot at a moving target before. So I had to figure out what my hold was. So if I was the target, right? I, I'd kind of talked to Travis, I was like, where should I hold? And he was like, hey, maybe try like right or left edge, depending what direction it's going in. I actually broke a shot early, which ended up making a hit. So if I'm the target, I actually had to aim like maybe half a body off to compensate for the, the bullet travel time, the distance, wind, whatever, um, which ended up working really well. Um, and then of course the target on top of the hill is just hella small. So that was kind of some of the considerations. And one of the things I really want to work on was make sure I braced really well. So without further ado, I'm gonna jump into the stage. So you can see here, like I'm just kind of preparing in my mind. You can already see I'm pre-staging my hand. Um, they actually give you a chance to set up on the position to kind of get a reference already. So I already knew where the target was and I, I had a good sight picture that I'd set up before. Um, it took me a couple shots to figure out the dope, if you will, right? Because you know, even though I'm zeroed 5,200, you know, there's a lot of wind up there. Uh, elevation of where you zero your rifle makes a big difference. Well, I zeroed my rifle in Arizona and was competing in Arizona. Some of the guys like Travis zeroed his rifle in Florida and you know, shot up here, which is like a couple thousand feet um, difference, which means the bullet is gonna do different stuff. If anything, it might, um, what he was telling me is the bullet might actually rise a little more. So as you saw, I made the two hits on the steel. I accidentally broke the shot a little bit early, connected twice with the steel, and then I'm just hauling ass to the, the next thing. Now I've never shot from a tank trap before, so it took me a second to figure out, okay, how am I gonna set the rifle up? And I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna use the tank trap as a vise and set the rifle right in between to get the most stable shot as, as I can. So I'm in there, I get I brace the gun in there, sighting in on the target, and just for reference, the 10 inch steel plate that I had in the hill 
if this was like the square, I was basically aiming at the bottom left of the uh, 10 inch plate and I was getting really good hits. Um, then of course, transition over to the mover. And it was kind of funny. I think I ended up, uh, I, I did really well there. I got a couple double hits and then just immediately went to the ladder. It was funny because once I got to the ladder, uh, maybe I was overcompensating or whatnot, but I had more of a difficult time shooting the uh, the mover. So get up there, make quick work of the 10 inch steel plate because by then I'd already shot it a couple times. I kind of had a good idea of the dope. So it never really took me more than like, I don't know, four, five shots to, to get two good consistent hits on there. And then this is kind of where I was starting to rush a little bit. And I had just had to make sure I took my time and waited for that target to come right out and connect with the steel. But you'll notice on every single one of these stages, um, I basically, every single one of these stages, what I did is I basically pre-staged the rifle in my hand. So that way uh, when I get to the barricade, I'm just basically securing locking onto that. And part of that is because the weekend, maybe a couple weekends prior to the competition, I actually focused on shooting barricades a lot because that's what the guys brought. So I got to experiment with that with kind of odd, weird shooting positions. But there's a lot of situations where that particular training worked out really well here. Um, so that was one thing that I really liked about that. So as you can see, I'm just kind of getting the gun all set up. This one, I did kind of make a mistake. I kind of overshot the barrel trying to brace on it and I had to kind of fix myself. But after that, I made quick work of the target. So. Yeah, you can see I kind of have a little bobble there, but I get right into it, locking the gun in. And these poppers are pretty tiny. This, the, Even though these targets are not as far, maybe like 100, 150 at most, maybe close to 200, uh, the 10 inch plate at the top of the hill. Um, not 100% sure how far it was, but um, those poppers are, even though they're a little closer, deceivingly hard to hit. So in this stage, you had to get two hits on each and you had to drag the barrel. And there was, I mean, I'm telling you, the magnifier made a huge difference um, on this stage and many of the stages that had really hard to see uh, targets. And I think in the beginning, guys were using the tank traps and some of the other obstacles and barricades, but you didn't need to. You just, just kind of stuck with the barrel, dragged the barrel, got my hits, would move on. And uh, this, this stage, I actually did pretty well. If anything, the hardest part was dragging the barrel. <laughs> Which you can see me kind of struggling with there, but yeah, I kind of just every single position I knew what I was doing Got into it made quick work of the steel I don't think I ever had more than like a one miss on any of the steel So I actually did very very well um, And you can see me just shifting my body transitioning to the target at the top of the hill and it, Doing stages like this does give you a pretty decent idea of what like a Potentially what a typical engagement could be like with a rifle like that against another human being. Because obviously when you play airsoft, you kind of like have a false idea of how far your engagement range is and how you read distance. So of course, it's really good to go out and shoot, shoot distance, because then you'll be re-familiarized with what your weapon is actually capable of doing. Um, yeah, got my hits uh, real quick over here. The last stage was kind of interesting. Travis told me to get the barrel set in. Um, Wanted to make sure I got the hits on the steel at the top. And then you had to transition down to a target at the same level. It's a hostage type target where the uh, target's right next to there. And so you, you can't actually shoot the uh, silhouette. So made quick work of that stage, um, but that one and stage six, I think I did really, really well on. This one was just a smoker because if you didn't know, Flagstaff has a big area that where there's a lot of volcanic rock, if you will. Um, which makes it very hard to run in. Uh, if you ever look at the footage of guys fighting in Iwo Jima, you'll kind of get an idea of just how bad it is just walking, let alone running with gear. So this stage you had to do like a dead sprint uh, up this hill after taking two shots on a steel plate, get up there, shoot some paper targets, then run up another hill, and then get up to a barricade and engage targets, uh, a couple small targets a little further away. But I think overall I did pretty good on this one, so. Stage go ahead and starts. I actually missed the first shot because I was just being a little impulsive, but I go ahead, make my head, haul ass up the hill. I basically transitioned to what I guess you would call like a football carry, where I football carried the rifle. And this is at the end, like, it's funny because this is like one of the last stages we did. So we were already tired from being in the sun and everything. So it, it sucked ass running up that hill. Um, so I did like the Pat Mac football carry, get up there. There's basically like an outline uh, with, that's made out of like fire hose. You get in there, blast a couple of paper targets and transition to steel on the right. So this part was pretty straightforward. 
made pretty work, pretty uh, quick work of the paper and then transitioned to the steel. Um, that one, I just had to pop my magnifier up just because it's really small steel, even though it's not very far away. And then of course, transition back to the football carry because like when it comes to movement, if your goal is to move um, and not necessarily be shooting right in that moment, then trying to do something that allows your body to have that good economy of motion will help out a lot. Um, so get up to the barricade. Um, and of course, last year, I mean, the targets were this target part was basically identical to how it was last year. But I made sure, got into position, made my hits, um, could have done a better job getting the rifle around the barricade itself, but then got settled in because my, my breathing is like kind of going crazy right now. So made the hits pretty dang quick, but believe it or not, some guys uh, just absolutely destroyed the stage um, and went super fast. So the next stage is interesting because you basically have to start with the gun unloaded shoot the steel, which again is, it's a much closer bay, but some of those steel targets are really small. So they'll get you. Then you gotta run up there, blast a couple more targets, unload the gun, run back, reload the gun, and engage. So go ahead, getting a good side picture. So standing by for the call. Are you ready? Stand by. And then yeah, get, getting the gun up in the fight um, right away. I actually ended up having the gun with the bolt locked to the rear, so it just made it a lot easier just to get the mag in there, um, press the bolt release, and just start engaging the targets. I ended up going small to big, which some guys went big to small in the targets. You had to get two hits on each of those three steel. Uh, get up on the platform, blast all the red coats. Just, that's what this uh, stage was, which is actually pretty funny. Uh, I had to do a pickup there because I think I transitioned too early. Um, blast the targets on the right, unload the gun, run back. So then this stage is actually a pretty quick stage, but you just have to make sure that you're very, very deliberate when you come off that stage with the rifle. Um, get the mag seated in the gun, and then you gotta work the steel targets again. So it's it was a fairly simple stage, but man, that's, that small target that was up at the top left, um, even though it was close, really uh, made some people's day suck. So yeah, that stage was pretty awesome. This stage here is very interesting because, again, the targets are up close, but the targets are on these like rubber swinging things. So when you shoot it, it moves. So there was a couple different techniques that we tried to mess around with, whether it was you hang out there and shoot the same target twice, or you shoot it, transition to the other one, shoot that one, and then transition to the back one because it would have settled. So a little bit of a gamble there. Um, some people were able to do this standing really well. I just did not want to fuck with that, and I just want to make it nice and I guess have a stable as platform as possible because I saw how much trouble this target was giving people. So I ended up doing a seated, seated position with like a basically a, like a reverse like C clamp if you will, kind of like this uh, to make my life a little easier. I took my time on that because I knew I'd make it up a little bit later on. But um, yeah, so I immediately take the seated position, get behind the gun. That little bugger was just tiny. That just gave people a lot of trouble, but um, Wanted to get good consistent hits, and of course, if you, if you didn't let the target settle into place, um, you'd get a miss. So you'll see me transitioning back to the small one, getting my hit. Now, because I'm in the same position, made it a little bit harder to get up, but once I'm up, I'm just going, going over to the uh, the next position and engaging the targets. Now, the paper targets didn't really present a problem. Now, as you can see here, I'm running with the magnifier up. In hindsight, and one of the big takeaways that I had for the whole event was just being more deliberate about flipping the magnifier up and flipping the magnifier down when I didn't need it because I kind of relied on it during a lot of the uh, a lot of the um, shooting. But there's one particular scenario toward the end where you'll see how that kind of kind of hurts me a little bit. But um, I definitely think for a lot of the closer up targets, I should just pop that thing down because I would have been able to blaze and shoot faster and probably save a couple seconds off my time. Um, but as you can see, I go back and forth, make quick work of that, run back to the um, position, because you have to do this relay like three times. Um, so I'm going through shooting paper targets, get two hits, two hits, run back. So there's a little bit of cardio involved in that regard. And uh, I just want to make sure that I got my hits. So I go ahead, make my hits on the steel, and then and they come running back and this is where i fucked up hide overboard ladies and gentlemen we're made quick look at the steel the part where i got the penalty was you're supposed to shoot the clay and the target 
And I was like, what the fuck? Because I'm holding at the top of the clay and I'm like, why am I hitting it? So I don't know if it was because I was using the magnifier or what, my height over bore was just like a lot more than, it's probably because the target was a little closer than it was last year. So the height over bore is like a lot. And I thought I was holding high enough, but right. that one clear. procedural cost me like, so you know, 15 places within the, uh, the standing. It would have been like 15 out of 90. So I got 32 out of 90, which is, you know, I'm definitely in the top half, but you always want to be as good as you can get. So. I think for me, the thing I want to work on personally is um, speed. Um, you know, having done airsoft before, people get a lot of questions about like, or I get a lot of questions about like, you know, how is airsoft good for training? And, you know, all the different things that you can do and how they kind of relate to each other. Competition shooting, whether you're an airsoft guy or a range guy and haven't tried it, is a really good way to test what you've learned. Um, you know, airsoft, I would almost say, airsoft is more about the strategy and the violence of action than it is about the shooting. Whereas competition shooting and um, you know most like shooting sports are a little bit more about the shooting because a lot of times they're like individual sports or individual you know competitions or whatnot. So I, w I still say to get the complete picture, there's no one thing you should focus on. Um, but having made that transition from airsofter to military to getting into shooting and trying to mess around with the competition shooting side, um, each one of those things has something of value to offer. And in order to be the best you can possibly be, you're going to kind of want to pick a little bit of each. So go to a Milsom event, practice teamwork, practice tactics. Strategy is going to be way more important than just shooting alone. Go to competition shooting, you know, figure out, uh, make, get your gun zeroed, figure out what the dope is, challenge yourself work on making hits, then work on making speed, and then kind of find find different stages and stuff that'll kind of do a little bit of both. There's a lot of different types of shooting competition where you can, um, you know, you know, expand your skills. Don't be married to one thing, because you know, there's a lot of guys I know who do competition who love to try milsim. I know there's a lot of milsim guys who love to try more flat range shooting or competition, and I know a lot of guys who are doing flat range shooting and kind of want to get into either one. Although for a lot of those guys, it's a little bit easier to get into competition shooting, but I feel like it, does you a disservice if you don't expose yourself to a little bit of everything. Um, but yeah, that's kind of my thoughts, my breakdown on my performance. I know what I want to work on, mainly speed, because I focused more on accuracy, but now it's like, okay, let's kind of work on the speed a little bit. Um, and I, I've been practicing at the range um, recently more and more, and um, definitely something that I think I can work on. So. Hopefully that helped you guys out. If you are someone that's kind of making that transition or jumping around, that's kind of my thoughts on how I perceive that kind of world and kind of how I got into it. But uh, hopefully it helped you guys out. So this is Spartan 117GW. Thank you guys for watching. And I'll see you guys next time.